So, uh, we've been going through a, a sermon series here. Um, took a little pause. My iPad's trying to install an update again. This happens like every single week I come up here. Um, took a little pause, had some questions, um, which was really good. I, how many of you like that, that little break in the routine? It was good. Maybe we should do something like that again with the junior high and high school. Um, <laughs> Although I might have to edit some of those questions. <laughs> and hopefully Bill will still be around when that happens. So, um, But uh, we're getting back to where, we, where we've been going. Sermon on the Mount, right? We've been doing the series for a purpose. Uh, started out this, this year looking at, at life. There's only two ways, two pathways of life. There's a life with God and there's a life without Him. One ends up in... in a life eternal with with him where all things are made new and another one lives in a death eternal uh, is absent of everything good with him and that us who who have found that life in him uh, that we're called to not only love him and follow him but to see him produce his life out of us that his life is called to be be seen in and through us that we're to be producing fruit. And that fruit is an expression of who he is. So we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount, trying to look at what it means, what, who Jesus is, and what he calls his people to be. Right? We, have a, we have a mission statement here. Um, anyone except for Patty know what that mission statement is? This is like six weeks we've been re- rehearsing this. Okay, Ken, you're an elder. You don't count. <laughs> We're growing to maturity in what we believe and how we live. All right, let's just make it simple. Next week, if you just get developing devoted disciples, then we will, we will be good. That's what we're here for. We're here to be a disciple first. Isn't that kind of our mission statement too? Yeah, that's our church's mission statement. Yep, absolutely. That's, that's the, the church's mission statement. The big church's mission like, Universal Church's mission statement. We're all called to make disciples. We're all called to be disciples. And we need to take this seriously. Uh, because this, this world is fast track to a bad place. It's, it's been on that way for a long time. And so I'm not just doing this because we, you know, it's just a new fangled thing to do. It's just God needs his people to be rooted and grounded in him. He needs his people to be like a Timothy, who has a Paul in front of them, teaching them and disciple them, and is raising up others behind him. And that's a call for all of us. So my heart here is that all of us together would grow to know what it means to be a disciple. And it would spill out into our lives. Because I can't be in every place. I'm not called to pastor every single person in Newcastle County. But we're a kingdom of priests called to go out into the world to make him known it's 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 a great calling and it's a short calling and we only have a short amount of time to do it so we're looking at the beatitudes last time i was up here we looked at blessed are those uh, who are meek right and we saw a kind of a little bit different understanding of meekness and this this refusal to be offended Instead, to trust God with everything. And now we're coming up to uh, the next verse in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. It's interesting to me this, uh, this last week, it was like right after our, ser- our service last week, when Paul, Bill and I were talking about um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, n- the next day I saw an article that they just found their next new discovery of a Dead Sea Scroll. The fragments in this cave that they had to rappel down into, they used a drone again to kind of look around. They found a, a, kind of a, a lot of amazing things, some coins from the Bar Kokhba revolt, and then they found these little fragments of a scroll, which were other pieces of stuff that they've already had. 
And those fragments are the scroll of uh, Zechariah and Nahum. And one of the ones they were able to translate that the Jerusalem Post had translated on their website, I just wrote it down here, which I thought was really good. Now it says this, these, thing, these are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to one another. Render true and perfect justice in your gates. And do not contrive evil against one another. And do not love perjury, because all those things I hate, declares the Lord. And this thing, 2,400 years or 2,200 years later, buried in the, in the ground, comes up on that date when the world is reeling right now. Um, and it comes up and speaks. God, God is speaking to our culture, to our society, to our world. Guys, all this mess that you're in would be solved if you just spoke truth to one another. You just had true justice. That you didn't lie or give a false account. And God's been speaking this over and over and over again. And this same concept comes in here in this passage, in this verse, and what God says here. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now, I don't have a complex outline here. I don't have a complex thing going on. I just want to define a couple things. I want to give you a couple points. I want to give you one thing to go home just to think about. Uh, but my first point here is this. And if I turned my remote on, it would work. We must first hunger for what we really need before we will ever be truly satisfied. We must first hunger for what we really need before we will ever truly be satisfied. Now this statement really is a statement that summarizes the Bible. It summarizes the gospel. And I think it was Martin Lloyd-Jones who said that this is the one most blessed statements and a, and a great test to know whether or not you are a Christian. Because if you read this and you see this as a blessing to you, then you can be sure that you are saved and that you know Christ. But if this does not seem to be a blessed statement for you, then you may need to re-back, go back and check your foundations. Because believers are called to look after and seek after righteousness. And it's a righteousness that is not defined by anything around me except what God defines himself. We're called to thirst after the thing that we need in order to get satisfied with the thing that we absolutely need. See, Jesus pulls this up, and I've talked about this before. We went over it when we want to overview. These, these Beatitudes, the eight of them that we have there, they build off one another. They lead into each other. Blessed are the, the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you're poor in spirit, you begin to mourn over the fact that you have no claim before God. You have nothing to bring to the table. I, I've got no way to save myself. I can't do it. So I mourn over it. And when I mourn over it, I actually come to terms with it. I don't have any reason to be offended towards anyone else. Because I have no right to, 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 to argue my own case. And once I do that, I start searching for the things that I need, the filling that I need. And I need righteousness. I need it deeply. I need it badly. I need it more than I understand. And Jesus is taking this and he's using something that is common to everyone. Being hungry, being thirsty. It's, it's amazing how God has designed the world. And I'm almost positive that he put hunger in this into our lives that desire for things, for, for something to satisfy, as, as, as a revelation of our need for Him. That we are hungry for food, but that hunger for food is only called to, to speak to a deeper hunger for filling from God. And this happens day one. How many of you had kids? How many of you there when, when that baby was born? All the mothers are raising their hands, hopefully. 
What happens after that baby's born? Well, now it comes out, it goes on a table, and the doctors start poking and prodding it and start screaming. But it's just amazing. This baby goes out with, with no training and looks for milk. It looks to eat. It's hungry. It's seeking it. It's seeking what it needs. It's just It's just incredible. And all of us understand this concept in part. Most of us here never really know, have known what it means to be f- truly hungry. I mean, sometimes the preacher goes to 11, 11.45, so, you know, we're getting there. But most of us haven't gone three days without food. Most of us haven't gone a day without water. But you start going there, you start getting hungry, you start getting thirsty, it doesn't matter what Berkey filter the water had gone through. I'm just going to drink it. It doesn't matter what kind of food is in front of me. I'm just going to eat it because I need it. And Jesus is saying, you're blessed if your hunger is not for the things of this world, but for righteousness. So the question is, what is righteousness? What am I supposed to be hungering for? Well, righteousness is just a, it's a simple judicial term. It's, it's just being true, being right standing, upright. Um, but righteousness according to the Bible is something different. So we can use righteousness in any, any kind of way. I can, I can, I'm righteous uh, right now as a citizen because uh, I'm following the rules, I'm following the protocols. I have my driver's license, I wear my seatbelt, I, you know, I do all the, all the, I pay my taxes, I'm righteous. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about something different. And my definition of righteousness, what I didn't put up on here, so you'll have to write it down if you are a note taker, or just memorize it if you're a genius. Um... Biblical righteousness is simply a life that adheres to God's perfect standard. A life that adheres to God's perfect standard. Or a life that lives up to God's perfect standard. Or a life that matches God's perfect standard. However you want to write that down, that's what it is. And when Jesus is talking about righteousness, he's talking about something that God himself has defined. God himself has set out. And what's interesting here is I've learned something new about the Greek as I was studying this passage. I took a lot of, I, there's a lot of things I can learn new about Greek. Um, I did take enough Greek in college, in college and seminary. But there's this new kind of thing, and this isn't boring. I'm not going to bore you. Um, but there's this concept that Greek uses when they talk about being hungry and thirsty. So when I'm hungry for water and I'm hungry for food, um, or I'm thirsty for water, hungry for food, they always use a genitive to describe what they want to eat or what they're hungry for or what they're thirsty for. Now, a genitive is a noun that gives like has that modifies another noun, um, and they use a, it's a, something typically that talks about possession of something. Um, and they usually use what's called a, a partitive genitive, which means it's a genitive of part. We would use the, the English word of to describe that. So when they're saying, I'm, I'm thirsty, they, if we just translate it literally, they would say, I'm thirsty of water, or I'm hungry of food. And what they're saying is, I'm thirsty for a part of all the water that's out there in the world. I would just like a part of it. Or I'm hungry for food. Out of all the food that's out of there, I just want a part of it. But here it's really interesting is that Jesus doesn't use a genitive when he in he doesn't use righteousness in a genitive form or case. He puts it in the accusative, which is the direct object. Now you didn't think you're going to come here to get an English uh, lesson, but the direct object of the sentence. And what he's saying for is, blessed are you who hunger and thirst for all of righteousness. Perfect righteousness. Not just a piece of it, not just a part of it, 
but all of it. Jesus is calling his people to look for righteousness. So if righteousness is a life that is adhering to the standard that God sets, that God is the one who who originates it, understands it, defines it, what does it actually look like in practice? Well, righteousness in this context is almost seen right after these next three uh, Beatitudes, which I'll go on in the next couple weeks. Blessed are the righteous. Righteousness people are merciful. People who are righteous are pure in heart. People who are righteous are persecuted for their righteousness. And you go through the rest of this sermon, you start seeing what righteousness looks like. That I'm not looking upon someone of the opposite sex with lustful intent. I'm not dwelling on those kind of things. I don't harbor anger and hatred towards my brother. I, I fulfill my oaths. I don't divorce my spouse. I fulfill my oath. I don't defend myself when I'm being insulted. I give him opportunity to give another insult. I turn my cheek. I don't worry about the things of this world or, or trying to make sure I take care of my life. I trust my Father. He provides for me, provided that I seek for His kingdom and His righteousness. Righteousness looks like someone who is looking like Jesus. Because righteousness is fully seen in Christ. The problem is that people don't naturally seek after righteousness. All of us are hungry. All of us are searching. All of us are looking to fill some kind of deep need in our life. But we don't, af- we don't often go after what actually fills. We know this, the world doesn't do this, and the church doesn't do this. The church does this sometimes, the church doesn't always do this. The world sees fulfillment, and what I, what I need is acceptance from people. Right now it's what it is. We've, we've gone just crazy in our culture. We've gone from, from I think, therefore I am, to I feel, therefore I am. And if I feel, you must believe and think that I, that I am what I feel I am. And if you think something different than what I feel, then you are wrong and I am I'm right. And as long as I can control everyone into believing what I feel I am, then life is going to be good. But it, it never results in anything. We, we, we were almost there when we think, I think therefore I am, because at least there's an understanding that emotions don't dictate truth. They lie to us all the time. But the world looks for, and you can enter anything into that, you know. New car, new house, that's going to make me fulfilled. New iPhone, new bowl of spaghetti, I don't know, whatever it is. We look for all these things to fulfill us, but it's never addressing the absolute need and and never touching and quenching the thirst that we have inside of us. Why? Well, turn 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 with me over to First John. I wasn't going to go there, but turn with me over to First John three. It's not not First John, John, Gospel John. Just write a couple couple books next door. Um, Chapter three. We know this three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but will have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. Light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their works were evil. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. The world is already condemned. We're born condemned. 
And people don't recognize who he is or seek after what actually satisfies because they like darkness rather than light. The world does not look for what we need. But we can turn the same concept into us believers who have found the fountain of living water, who have who've received salvation to go on after things that are not consistent with who we are or what we claim to believe. And we see Jeremiah talking about this in Jeremiah 2, 12-13. Be appalled, O heavens! Look at this! Be shocked! Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. This is common in our human condition. We have a fountain of living water in, in God who's given us everything that we need. Then we go on and we seek for satisfaction in something else other than in Him Himself. Many of you have come here spiritually hungry. And for you, it looks like this. The grass is always greener. My neighbor has a better house. I should have got that Tesla. Should have moved to the south. Should have gone to Texas. Thank God I'm not in New Jersey. Um... We go place to place and we, and we sanitize these things. We put religious terms around them. You go from one speaker to a next, one conference to another conference, looking for something that's actually going to fulfill us and satisfy. One Christian meeting, this worship experience, this other thing, this book's actually going to give me some, some satisfaction. This thing's finally going to, going to free me. This thing's going to, and just, you just go throughout life, throughout life, throughout life, throughout life, looking for a man cre- created, man centered solution to a problem that God's already solved. And hewing out a broken cistern that is just leaking water. It fills for a moment, and it never, ever satisfies. Most of us know this quote from Augustine. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And that is the motto of the Christian life. Our restless hearts find our rest in Christ. You see, happiness is not found by searching for happiness. Happiness is not found by searching for blessedness. Happiness is not found by searching for wealth or something that's going to give me something I think I need. Happiness is only found, found and only found in searching after true righteousness. And true righteousness is Christ. True satisfaction and fulfillment is found only in Christ. If we truly hunger for righteousness, we will truly seek after the one who is righteous. Jesus, our Savior, our Master, our Lord, our King. In Him, the fullness of God dwelled bodily. Because of Him, because of what He's done. 1 Corinthians uh, 5.21 For our sake He made Him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. He is our righteousness. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 1.30 Because of Him... You are in Christ Jesus, who 
This is Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. We can go on and on and on and I don't think it's necessary. I don't know if I need to belabor this point. Righteousness of God has been revealed apart from the law. It is it is Jesus. And true satisfaction is only found in Him. There's a reason why Christ came. And He comes up in the Feast of, of, of tab, Tabernacles. He says, Come to Me, all who are thirsty, and I will give you drink. There's a reason why He says, I am the true manna coming down from heaven. Because He's the one who fully satisfies So when God's talking about hungering and thirsting after righteousness, He's talking about hungry and thirsting after what the complete picture of the Christian life is. A life that says, I have nothing within me, no good thing dwells in me, I need help, I am unworthy, I know I am. But because of your grace, I stand unashamed. I receive your Son, and He gives me life. He lives my life. He is my life. He changes me. He's redeemed me, paid for everything. He's called me righteous, and then He's making me to be what He's called me to be. The theological terms are that are justification, righteousness, but also sanctification. And sanctification is a process wherein my life starts to look like what I'm called to be, what God says I am. So I'm a little bit less angry every day. I'm a little bit less lustful every day. I stop cheating on my taxes. I stop cheating my customers. And when someone who's hired me for a job stiffs me, I don't go and go crazy. I trust the Lord with it. And God starts changing me. And in that process, we begin to desire and hunger that our lives would be like His. We're not satisfied with just living how we want to live. I can't make a statement and say, well, I feel like I need to do this, and it's absolutely against what God's Word says, and say, it's okay because I feel I need to do it. No, that's not God's righteousness. That's your own righteousness, and it's nothing. It's worthless. It's filthy rags. We say, God, you have set the standard. You you have laid out what is good and profitable and, and, and constructed for human flourishing. And I want that in my life. I want to be someone who's living up to who you've already called me to be. I know that I am righteous because you say it. But I also know my actions. So please make those two things congruent. And it doesn't just stay there. We are not just hungry and thirsty for my own personal satisfaction, but I want to see it around me. I want to see it in my community, with my neighbors, at my job. I want to see it in my nation. Because I know this is how people flourish when they live and follow the Grand Master's design. He created everything. He created us. He created us with a purpose and intention. A, and, and it's like we're taking a Mercedes or a Ferrari, attaching a snow shovel to it, and trying to drive around and plow snow. It's not what it's meant for. We're meant to know Him, to love Him, to live for Him, to be kind and merciful. To be peacemakers. And just to circle back on this hungry thing. Jesus says he's the manna from heaven. What was manna? It's 
stuff showed up every morning. What were the Israelites supposed to do? Gather it up for a day. What happened if they gathered more than a day? It was spoiled. How does that relate to our life with Christ? We cannot rely on what we gathered yesterday. We cannot rely on what we gather when we were 12 year old in a, in a church when God called when God called me to Himself and I raised my hand and walked up this, walked down the this thing aisle. We have to seek and gather every day. We trust we are what He's who He says we are, and then we. Gather for Him to provide for us what we need for this day to make our lives look like what He's called us to be. So if true satisfaction is found when we first hunger for what we really need, and true satisfaction and fulfillment is only found in Christ, what do we do with this? Just make it simple. Just evaluate what you're thirsting for. Nobody ever grows until, unless they take inventory. You can take that and you can, you can set that in any aspect, any sphere of life. I will never grow my business unless I assess my inventory. I'll never grow personally unless I assess my inventory. I'll never be a good athlete unless I assess what's going on in me. And it's okay to sit back and be introspective and start looking. Lord, Am I thirsting after you? Are you my first thought when I wake up? Are you my first desire when I get my feet on the ground? And if it's not, amen. Praise the Lord. You just realized it. You say, Lord, please be my first desire. Change the things that I'm hungering after to be you. And if you're sitting there and you've never, ever come to see and receive the satisfaction that is in Jesus, out there, where this doesn't even make sense, it's not difficult. This is a simple prayer. If this is true, God, and you're out there, Please help me to hunger for what's truly righteous. I need you. Please save me. Help my unbelief. And talk to someone in here. There's lots of strong believers in this this crowd. It's out there. It's free. It flows. Jesus has given everything that you need. And that pain that is coming up in your mind, that thing you're hungry for, which I know is there, can and will be solved in the sufficiency of Jesus. He's sweet. He's nourishing. He's everything that you need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your son. I thank you for how you gently lead us I thank you that you have established a standard, Lord, that you've given it to us, that you don't make it complex, that you lay it out and you've done the work for us. Lord, help us to desire you and plant this into our hearts, that our hunger and thirst are not for things that don't satisfy, but only for the one who does. In Jesus' name.